Maybe the best way to start is with a question. Uh, do you think that uh, America needs more Christianity in public life or less? Do we need more Christianity in public life or less? There's a lot of Americans who are very concerned about the state of our democracy and concerned about the amount of cultural change we've had in recent generations. They look at the state of our country, they're alarmed, and they think that the answer is that we need to get back to our roots. We need to return to the way things used to be, they say, because things used to be more Christian, uh, more moral, more, more stable, more orderly, uh, and Christianity offered an, an anchor. It was the public philosophy of the United States. To be an American was more or less to be a Christian, and to be a Christian was to be an American, at least within these shores. You've all heard this sort of complaint, I'm sure, but this also has a scholarly counterpart. There are scholars who make a version of this argument. All right, so Samuel Huntington, you may be familiar with his famous clash of civilizations thesis. He also wrote quite a lot about America. And, and he made the kind of the scholarly argument that we are defined, in his words, as a, as a nation of Anglo-Protestantism. I want to be very clear that he didn't mean that in a racist or a theocratic sense. He didn't say, we all have to be white, we all have to be Christians. He said it was rather about culture, that America was defined by a specific cultural heritage, the cultural heritage of Anglo-Protestantism. And he believed that anybody of any race or religion could assimilate to that culture. And Huntington thought that this was so essential to being, an, uh, to being American that we would actually lose our sense of self. We would even lose our democracy if we lost our Anglo-Protestantism. He thought, in his words, he said, the American creed of liberty and equality is Protestantism without God. Protestantism without God. And so if we lose our Protestantism, we'll lose our creed as well, more or less. Now, it's true that our culture has changed. Uh, the United States is less Christian than it's ever been in four centuries, since the beginning of European settlement in the New World. It's also less European. Is that the problem? Is American democracy in crisis because our culture has changed so much? Do we need to get back to America as a Christian nation? Now, you probably know already, my answer is no. I'm going to describe that as Christian nationalism and explain all the things wrong with it. But I kind of want to uh, make sure that I don't over-argue, because I think maybe some of you already agree with this, and I want to make sure that I'm not leading you to believe uh, that there's no role for Christianity in public life, uh, that there's no role for patriotism, or that there's no role for Christians to be active in politics. I think that there is. So I want to try to steer a, what I think is a fairly middle course here, warn against the dangers of Christian nationalism, but also try to hold up some healthy vision of what it means to be a Christian in America. That's my hope and my prayer for our talk this, this evening. So to start, I want to talk about patriotism. Um, and I want to start this way because so often when I debate nationalists, they start by saying, what's wrong with loving your country? And I want to make sure that I say, nothing. Right? There's nothing wrong with loving your country. In fact, not only is there nothing wrong, I think it's a positive virtue. I think it is a good thing to be grateful for where we come from. It's a, it's a good thing to be uh, uh, aware of the ways that our country has... Um, uh, inducted us into the forms of flourishing that we've come to know. And so we should, we should be grateful. I root patriotism not in pride, but in gratitude. Uh, we've all been given so much that we haven't made or earned. We've been given it by the social, cultural, and political institutions that surround us that were here before we got here, and they'll long outlast us too. And we should be grateful for the, the great things they do and the great things they are. And, and even more than that, perhaps you know this quote from C.S. Lewis. He praised simply the love of home, the place we grew up in, of places 
uh, near these and like them, the love of old acquaintances, of familiar sights, sounds, and smells, a love for the way of life, for the local dialect, and more. It's very normal, and it's very natural, and it's very good to have that special affection for the place you call home. And so I think patriotism is an expression of that gratitude. Uh, so keep that in mind as I go on and critique nationalism. Nothing out of what I say should be taken as an indictment of nationality or affection or gratitude for where we come from. In fact, I'm going to circle back to this at the end and suggest to you that cultivating this kind of affection and patriotism is the best inoculation against nationalism. It's the best safeguard, the best rail against nationalism. If you want to you know, beat the nationalists, be, be a patriot. So hold on to that thought. Nationalism isn't just loving your country. And, and even the folks out there who are saying that that's all they mean, quite often if you push on it a little bit, they'll start to say, well, I love my country because of this particular culture. You see, nationalism is actually an argument about how you define your country, how we define what our country is. It's an argument about national identity. It's an argument about how we draw borders and boundaries, uh, how we say who is and isn't part of the nation. Uh, it's an argument about the nature and purpose and duties of government as well, to sustain and uphold a certain national identity. Nationalism is a decision principle, so to speak. It's the criteria by which we say, this is us and that's not us. And nationalists locate that decision principle in culture. Culture. Not creed, but culture. Nationalists will look out across the world. They'll draw a mental map of the world's cultures. And to them, that map looks a lot like a checkerboard in the sense that each square is divided from the other squares by clear, hard, distinct, easily drawn boundary lines. So you've got one square over there that's the essence of Frenchness, uh, French identity, right? Baguettes and the Riviera and the French language, right? And the square next to it is the essence of Germanness, German identity, sauerkraut, right? Uh, and the nationalist thinks that the line between them, you can just draw it super easy. You know exactly where that line is. The stuff over here is easily identifiable as Frenchness, and the stuff over there is easily identifiable as Germanness. And once the nationalist has drawn that map of the whole world, the nationalist simply says, every square gets their own government. And that's the essence of nationalist political ideology. They believe that all the cultures should govern themselves, have their own government, Thus, we have nation states. It's kind of like a sovereign culture, essentially. All peoples, all cultures ought to govern themselves. Uh, it also implies a certain vision of what government is for. If that's how you think of the relationship between government and culture, it, it also says that government has a role in protecting not just the physical territory or the physical lives of the citizens, but protecting the essence of Frenchness, the essence of Germanness, the cultural identity, that it's the government's job to regulate your culture, to say, this is who we are, this is who you are. We, the government, get to say, this is your cultural identity. You're actually vesting the government with quite a bit of power there to tell you what your cultural and even moral framework is. That's nationalism. It's relatively straightforward to define Christian nationalism, American Christian nationalism. Christian nationalists look at America, and they say, OK, that square on the checkerboard, that's America. And who are we as a people? We are a Christian people. We are a Christian nation, or perhaps sometimes Judeo-Christian, or Anglo-Protestant. The adjectives change, but the basic idea is about the same. Uh, America is a Christian nation. And therefore, the government ought to keep it that way. That's the really important second component of nationalist dogma, is the government's responsibility. If you tell me that America's a Christian nation, look, there's some ways in which I can agree with that. If, it, if you're simply making a statement of the religious profession of a supermajority of Americans, yeah, we've always, most of us, professed Christianity. If you're making a statement about the influence of Christianity in American history, sure. Even the 
rough consistency between Christian principles and the principles of our founding documents. I can see that too. Those are all true statements. But if you want to say in the future the government has a role as a point of public policy to keep this particular cultural identity and support it, defend it, even mandate it in some sense, well, that is, that is Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism shows up sometimes not just in this philosophical sense, but also as a set of attitudes. You'll hear it sometimes. You'll notice it. Christian nationalists, uh, you'll hear Christians sometimes speak as if we are entitled to primacy of place in the public square. Because in some sense, we, we, we think or act as if we are the kind of the heirs of America, the, uh, the heirs of the true or essential meaning of what it means to be an American. Um, that we Christians have a kind of presumptive right to define the meaning of the American experiment uh, because we see ourselves as America's architects, uh, first citizens or guardians. There is sometimes a kind of a proprietary or possessive sense. We invented America. You're welcome. We should stay on top. Right? That's the, I think, attitude I sometimes sense in the nationalist discourse. But what does this look like in practice? I mean, I mean I, you know, this is all very theoretical and philosophical. What does it look like down to earth? What does Christian nationalism look like embodied in practice? Let me give you a couple of examples that I think help make this more concrete. Christian nationalism, I think, looks like the Patriot's Bible. This is a real thing. You can go on Amazon and find it. The Patriot's Bible, a Bible that, quote, shows how the history of the United States connects the people and events of the Bible to our lives in a modern world. The story of the United States is wonderfully woven into the teachings of the Bible. I think that's Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism looks like the Patriot Church Network, a spiritually active, governmentally engaged, grassroots effort designed to take back our communities and fight against the forces that are destroying the very cultural and religious fabric that makes the USA so special. Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism, I think, looks like the 29% of Americans who believe that, quote, the federal government should declare the United States a Christian nation. It looks like the 65% of Americans who believe that it is important that a citizen be a Christian to be, quote, truly American. 65%. The Constitution does actually have a prohibition on tests, religious tests for public office. Uh, Christian nationalism also looks like the very common practice of citing Psalm 3312 or 2 Chronicles 714. Who knows those verses? Anybody? Psalm 3312, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. 2 Chronicles 714, uh, if my people who are called by my name. Right? The common practice of citing those verses and applying them to America. You'll see this all the time around American patriotic holidays. Fourth of July, Memorial Day, you'll see the flag uh, or other patriotic images juxtaposed with those verses. I think it's very clear Christian nationalism, the, the image of uh, America being called by God's name, being the nation whose God is the Lord. I think Christian nationalism can also look like sometimes uh, curricula in school. Um, the teaching of history is a particular battleground where people uh, argue for different understandings of American identity. And there is a Christian nationalist cottage industry seeking to teach American history in a Christian nationalist way, to teach that America has been in a special relationship with God uh, or represents him in some sense or has a special mission to carry out. These images of Christian nationalism that I've given you are uh, pretty, I think, popular, fairly mainstream, fairly broad, but they're also fairly peaceful. Um, and, I, you know, I wouldn't, I'd say benign compared to what I'm about to say. Right. So Christian nationalism can look like these things, which are, again, mainstream and fairly uh, popular and also peaceful. Which is why it's important to emphasize a few other images of Christian nationalism. Uh, Christian nationalism exists along a spectrum 
from the popular mainstream and peaceful to a more alarming, extreme, and even violent manifestations. So Christian nationalism looks like this, a belief that we should only allow immigrants into the United States who accept our values or culture, such as a candidate for the United States Senate who tweeted his opposition to welcoming Afghan refugees after the fall of Kabul last year because they supposedly endangered our, quote, Judeo-Christian way of life. So I would call that nativism, maybe xenophobia, and I also think it's Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism looks like the Reawaken America tour, which is happening right now. It's packing out churches around the country as General Michael Flynn and others tour and lecture in churches, packing out thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of professing Christians to hear lectures about COVID conspiracy theories and the 2020 election. That's another face of Christian nationalism. And finally, yes, I do think we can also see Christian nationalism on January 6th of 2021. The Christian flag, Christian worship music, the cross erected on public grounds, the rioters who violently stormed the Capitol and stopped on the floor of the U.S. Senate and prayed. Jesus Christ, we invoke your name. Thank you that this is our nation. Thank you for filling this chamber with patriots that love Christ so that the United States could be reborn. It's about as clear a statement of Christian nationalism as I can imagine. This is our nation. Thank you for filling the, this with, with patriots who love Christ. It doesn't get more explicit than that. So I wanna, I wanna hasten to add again that um, Christian nationalism is on a spectrum. Not all Christian nationalists storm the Capitol. Not all Christian nationalists are violent extremists. But I, I, I gave you that spectrum so that you understand the, the potential is there. There is an extremist element. There's an extremist potential uh, within this ideology of Christian nationalism. Now, I want to argue that this is actually intrinsic to nationalism as a political ideology. I think all nationalisms can go this route. Let's set aside America, let's set aside Christianity, and just talk about the theory of nationalism again. Right, so let's go back to that theory of what nationalism is. I think all nationalism can go down this road of being illiberal and even extreme and violent. And why is that? Because nationalism is, in fact, incoherent at its roots. I gave you the, the theory of it. I tried to give you a, a strong version of what it says of itself, the checkerboard of the world's cultures. But the map of the world's cultures is not a checkerboard. It is more like a Venn diagram, the overlapping circles. Right? The border lines between the world's cultures are not clear and distinct and hard. They are blurry, and they overlap, and they're constantly moving and changing, and they're not even circles. They're blobs. And over years and years, they shrink and they expand and they change. Some disappear, some new ones come about. And it's impossible to draw a map once and for all and say, this right here, this is the essence of, of Frenchness. This is the essence of what it means to be an American. You just simply cannot draw those borderlines, which also means it's deeply foolish to try to make them the foundations of your political boundaries. Uh, you could simply ask, uh, the, Christ the nationalists, by what principle are they drawing boundary lines? Is it language? Is it religion? Is it ethnicity or race? Is it uh, some other principle? Uh, they've always given different answers and they've never landed on one single principle. And if they ever did, who, who, who elected them to say? Who, why, did our, why did they get to tell us which principle to organize our, our politics around? Uh, we inhabit a world of fuzzy and blurry cultures and that's simply a fact, but it's also, I think, good. It's a wonderful part of the world's diversity and pluralism. I recall when I was backpacking through Europe 20, more than 20 years ago, uh, I happened to share a train car with a bunch of young men who introduced themselves as Pomaks. They were Bulgarian-speaking Muslims who were citizens of Greece. 
They were the wrong citizenship to be Bulgarians. They were the wrong religion to be considered Greek. They lived on the wrong side of the border to be considered Turks. They were Pomaks. And this is an example of the peoples who fall through the cracks of the theory of nationalism. Nationalism wants to draw these boundary lines and say, this is who you are. And how many of us actually fit into those categories? Uh, very few of us. When you draw those boundary lines, you are always, always, always creating minorities and uh, dissidents within those boundary lines you've drawn. It, it's simply impossible to manufacture or create or draw any lines that create a cultural homogeneity. It does not exist. Every polity in the world is essentially a multi-ethnic, pluralistic, uh, polyglot uh, empire of, of some sort or another. That's just the empirical description of what the world is like. To the nationalist, that's a problem they need to solve. I think it's just something uh, that we can celebrate. The problem comes when the nationalists approach this problem Every way they have to try to solve this problem is illiberal. Illiberal. OK, what do I mean by that? When I say it's illiberal, I mean it is uh, against classical liberalism. It is against the, the theory, the philosophy of the American founders. It's against the ideas of an open society. A liberal society, an open society, is one that allows free culture. If we believe in free speech, if we believe in free religion, then it's just a half step further to say we believe in free culture. You're allowed to be whatever culture you want. The nationalist comes in and says, no, 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 you have to be this culture. You have to be an American culture. You have to be a Judeo-Christian, Anglo-Protestant culture to be one of us. And so when they do that, they are, uh, uh, they are saying, you're not one of us to cultural minorities, to dissidents. I'm guessing many of you have heard Others say, we're the real Americans. Pause for a minute about what that actually said. What are they actually saying there? What are they saying about the other Americans, the coastal elites, the people in other states, uh, that they're fake Americans, they're temporary, they're second class Americans? Uh, Christian nationalism is inhospitable, uncharitable towards cultural minorities, uh, whether it's ethnic, religious, linguistic minorities. It is inhospitable. It treats them as second-class citizens. And that's the most polite way I can say it. I think we all know that that sort of inhospitality can become manifest in far more aggressive and oppressive ways. But even if it doesn't, even if it is wears a benign face, I still think it is inhospitable and therefore incompatible with the ideas of an open society and the ideas of Christianity, which says that we should love our neighbors and not look down our nose at them as a second-class citizen. Nationalism in its uh, fixation on cultural unity has another problem to it. Um, it's impractical. How many of you actually believe the government is capable of manufacturing cultural homogeneity, right? It can barely deliver the mail, right? But, it, but it's also like, who wants to live in that world? My favorite anecdote here, uh, there's a book uh, arguing for nationalism by a guy named Rich Lowry. And in the course of arguing for why nationalism is, why he thinks American culture is not intrinsically white, he cites jazz. And he says, look, jazz is part of American identity. I love jazz. Jazz ain't white. And so let's celebrate American identity and not be called racist for it. Right? That's his argument. I get it. I agree. Jazz is great. That's not white. But his whole argument is that uh, we should preserve, quote, preserve the cultural nation. But if you're an American nationalist 100 years ago, and your goal is to preserve the cultural nation, what are you going to think about jazz? you're going to call it un-American, which they did. The critics, the white critics of jazz in the 1920s said this was voodoo music. They said all kinds of really nasty things about it because their nationalism was both racist and culturalist. So if you want to claim jazz for American identity, which, which I do, and it's wonderful, 
you also have to recognize that it, it requires us to be open to the cultural fluidity, the change, the intermingling, the blurriness that I think is intrinsic to all cultures. That's the essence of what it means to be an American. And it means free culture, not nationalism. If all this is true, and we shouldn't be Christian nationalists, what then? How then shall we vote? Uh, what is the right way to be an American, to be a Christian in America, to understand our relationship between these identities? How can we uh, still be a faithful Christian, work for justice, work for flourishing, vote in the public square, um, at, without falling into these dangers? Let me use the rest of our time to dwell on this with a, a couple of questions here. Um, our goal as Christians should not be cultural predominance. That's not what we're called to. Our goal is righteous governance. It is appropriate for us to desire to seek the welfare of the city in which we've been exiled. It is appropriate for us to seek righteousness because righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. Uh, it is good for us to desire that our rulers establish their thrones on righteousness. Uh, and so I affirm all of that. We should strive for righteousness and justice. Uh, m some Christians use that to argue that we should vote our values and Christianize society. Now, I've just outlined a whole lot of problems with that. But let's, uh, this is a theological question. Can we, should we, how can we pursue justice, which we should do, without pursuing Christian nationalism, which we should not do? Uh, I want to pose uh, the, the answer this way. We need to be careful about how we define our values, what we expect of our government, and be careful about the separation of church and state. All right? How we define our values, what we expect of the government, and how we understand the separation of church and state. These are the three things I want to keep in mind as we vote our values. So first, what values are we talking about? In the past, uh, Protestants in America thought that it was essential to their values to keep Catholics out of public office. That was really important for about 250 years. Um, thankfully, that ain't true anymore. But that was a value they voted on and voted for and put in state constitutions across the country for decades and centuries. So our values, we need to take a very close look to make sure that they are not sectarian or discriminatory. If we're going to vote our values, let's make sure it's a value that we can broadly share with Americans. Um, is our version of morality uh, broadly shared? This is a democracy. We share the country with people who don't share our theology and oftentimes don't share our sense of morality. We need 51% of the vote to pass anything. So is, are the values we're proposing, are, are they popular? Are, can we get some agreement here? That's a very good test case to ask. And maybe you should ask, how does the smallest minority feel about the values we're trying to pass. Second, what are we expecting of the government and how much faith are we having in the government to, uh, to enforce our values? 100 years ago, we successfully passed a constitutional amendment to ban alcohol. How'd that work out? Yeah, uh, it created enormous negative externalities it incentivized a black market. It funded organized criminal gangs. And we saw an outbreak of gang warfare on American streets for a decade. Uh, that's, not, that's not my values, right? Uh, I think uh, sometimes Christians who want to see their values reflected in law uh, overestimate the competence of the government to enforce them, overestimate the popularity of those values, and overestimate uh, people's willingness to obey those laws once passed. Now, uh, none of that comments on the rightness or wrongness of the value in question. We could still believe drunkenness is bad. I think that's true. Public drunkenness is bad. But does that mean necessarily that we, m is the next step really make the government crack down on the sale and transportation of alcohol? Not necessarily. There's other ways of pursuing temperance. 
And the third question I'd ask here is about the separation of church and state. And this is a complicated question, so pardon me if I spend just a tad more time on this. We need to affirm the biblical doctrine, the biblical doctrine of disestablishment, of the separate jurisdictions of church and state. And note that I said biblical doctrine, not constitutional doctrine. It is both, but the Bible is more important than the Constitution. And I think the Bible is very clear, because I'm a Baptist, that the churches should be disestablished. Uh, Jesus said that his kingdom is not of this world. He gave the keys of the kingdom to the apostles, which means it is the church's authority, the church's exclusive prerogative to be the body and the voice of Jesus Christ on earth. We can't allow the state to take over any of that ministry. We can't outsource our ministry to Caesar. That's a foolish thing to do. Uh, and that means if we're voting our values, it cannot involve in any sense Caesar taking over the teaching ministry of the church. Practical example, school prayer. The Supreme Court struck down uh, prayer in public schools in 1963, and a lot of Christians like to complain about that. I think it was rightly decided. I do not want a government employee teaching my children how to pray. That is not their job. It is my job and it is the job of my pastor and my wife and you know, our, our family within the church. It's very dangerous to include secular authorities because you don't know. We've, we lose control over what we're actually teaching if we allow Caesar to step in and start assuming that teaching ministry. As important as protecting the church's purity is, we also need to protect ourselves from political religious tyranny. Just open up a, a book of history, any book of history of any time period in any civilization, and you'll see examples of political leaders who hijack religion religious rhetoric and religious morality to use it as a legitimizing of a fig leaf, a prop for whatever injustice they want to propagate. And you better bet that white Protestants did that in America. History is replete with these examples. Uh, the biggest danger of this is the creation of hollow religion. If we uh, expect the state to enforce our values, uh, public morality enforced at the point of a sword and given a Christian gloss is not true heart piety. It is social conformity, legalism, and a new version of political correctness. It is the religion of the Pharisees. It teaches people that they are Christians if they obey social convention. The resurrection of Christendom is not the point of Christianity. The resurrection of Christendom is not the point of Christianity. So when we vote our values, these are the things to keep in mind. The state isn't terribly competent, our values may not be that popular, and we need to be careful of the separation of church and state. Within those boundaries, absolutely, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-religious liberty, I'm pro-family, and I will seek careful, prudent ways to advance those values in the public square. I invite you to do the same, but keep these tests in mind. As I close, let me uh, close by asking what is the alternative, and what does it mean to be an American? If we are not to be Christian nationalists, how do we seek to understand American identity? And I think the answer is clearly, um, it begins with the creed, but it does not end there. When I started writing this book years ago, I thought I was gonna conclude by vindicating pure creedalism. Anybody who believes in the creed is American. I was actually persuaded in the course of writing the book that's not sufficient because of what I said at the beginning about patriotism. Uh, and so I want to reaffirm that as, as I come to a close, that we need a sense of belonging and gratitude for where we come from, particularly the story of, that, uh, that, that we live in. Um, that's the thing that our patriotism attaches to. Now, the creed is part of that. And I think that what it ends up being is the story of the creed. That's what it means to be an American. It means to be a, an inhabitant of the story, of the creed. We preached a great creed at the beginning and didn't even come close to living up to it, and yet every generation we tell the story. Every generation we get closer and closer to living up to a better version of it. We become a better version of ourselves. We can 
we, we should be grateful for the past chapters in that story. And that gratitude is the root of our patriotism. That patriotism then inspires us to move into the next chapter, to take responsibility for, for unfolding that story, for, for making it better in the next chapter, which is not, uh, which is not a foregone conclusion. Look around you, look at the newspapers. We all know American democracy is in crisis, and it doesn't look like the next chapter is all that great. It should be your patriotism that inspires you to love your country enough to step into the story and carry it forward into the next chapter. That's my responsibility, it's your responsibility, and it's our story together as Americans. And I would look forward to taking that story with you to the next chapter. Thank you very much. Yes. I have a question of uh, the separation between church and state. Um, your point of having the prayers taken out of school, where then is the line drawn for like, the president leading a prayer over our yep. nation? Yep. Great question. Um, essentially, what about our civil religion? Right? Uh, the pageantry of American public life that uh, often does use religious symbolism and rhetoric, and we have prayers on official occasions and whatnot. So public school is different because it's compulsory and it's with children. Um, and I think it's important to have a pretty strict and firm separation in public schools when it's a compulsory activity aimed at kids. I'm fairly relaxed about uh, other forms of civil religion. Um, having a prayer at the inauguration, for example, um, or singing uh, essentially hymns on patriotic occasions, I mean, that's okay because they're, they're, they're voluntary and they are expressive, and they're also kind of true reflections of American history. You just can't tell any version of American history without some reference to religion and to Christianity in, in particular. And so it would be a, a false version of the story to edit out all references to God or to Christianity. That would not be helpful. What does the left got wrong? We're out of time. <laughs> what has the left gotten wrong? I mean, where do I, can you narrow it down for me? No, no, it, it turns to narratives. Ah, okay, there it is, yeah. Um, has anybody here read Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States? Yeah. Or the, the 1619 Project? Yeah. Um, I think that, so I talked about patriotism. I, I think that the left, so rewind about 70 or 80 years, American history was told as a triumphalist tale. Uh, America does no wrong. All of our sins are in the past. Nothing else to say. You know, nothing to see here. Um, revisionist history comes about as a corrective. Thankfully so. We need a correction. Perhaps we've overcorrected. Uh, Howard Zinn's book is not very good. It is, it is a cherry picking of all the bad things of American history strung together as if that's all there is to say. Uh, and I don't think that's a helpful or good way of telling the story of American history. It's not a true way. It is not a true way of telling the story of American history, nor is it helpful. Uh, 1619, this is a complicated one because uh, lots of conservatives love to beat up on it. And I don't agree that America was founded in 1619. I don't think that's, a, I don't think that's true either. Um, however, I don't think conservatives ever bother reading the original essay, which is fantastic. The original essay by Nicole Hannah-Jones is a manifesto of black patriotism and about how African Americans should love the country because they built the country. And I think this is wonderful. I, I love this. I think we need more of this. So that's my take on 1619. Uh, I think that the left has not done a great job of telling a unified story of who we are. Uh, identity politics comes into play here. This is another complicated issue. Identity politics is necessary for groups who need to simply band together to survive, which was sadly true for much of American history. Um, but if that is the end of your politics, then you're closing off the possibility of joining something bigger. So I uh, would want to see identity politics lead to the, the, the whole, uh, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Where's the, where's the one on the left? We have the many, where's the one? That would be a grossly insufficient answer to your question. Yeah. Who do you think has it right 
in terms of the relationship between uh, Christianity and uh, patriotism. Who would you say would be an example of someone who has a right? Uh, so I'm not going to, certainly not going to point to either political party. Um, oh, the question is who's gotten it right? Uh, the relationship between. Pastor President. Pastor President. Well, so in the book, I, I deliberately chose to end the main, end chapter 10 with Frederick Douglass, uh, who was a, a Christian, ordained minister in the AME tradition. Um, who, who, because he was a Christian, both loved and damned America. Loved it for what it could be, and loved it for its ideals, and damned it for its practice. I think he got it right. And I deliberately chose to use that voice to end the text with. That's just one example. I, there's, there's more than just that one, one person, but that, that would be one example. Um, many extreme versions of Christian nationalism are spreading on social media. Can you talk a little bit about ways you think that can be countered, or how what what kind of responses uh, should be taken to deal with that? Um, social media um, is uh, of the devil. No, not quite. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, social, social media is accelerating the polarization uh, in both directions. Um, uh, however, I don't think the solution lies in technology in, or in regulation, uh, at least not that I've seen yet. I'm not convinced there is a plausible technological or policy solution to that. Social media is a megaphone that amplifies what's already there in the human heart. All, all technology. Technology is just a way of amplifying human power. So you're a sinner. Technology is going to make you a bigger sinner or just amplify your sin. Um, so it's trite, but the ultimate solution, of course, lies in the human heart. Uh, I'm, I, OK, so, so that you're, you're concerned about the value of sort of tolerance and recall my caution about what the government is capable of doing. If we try to take steps to crack down on hate speech or extremist speech, think about the possible negative externalities. Right? That's giving the government quite a lot of power to regulate what we say. Um, now, social media companies, they can choose to do that. They have the right to, because they're not the government. Um, uh, but I, but I'm, I'm very wary about letting the government get involved in that kind of thing. So does that make sense? Yeah, it's not satisfying. Yeah. It's, a difficult, it's a difficult situation, I would yeah. agree. No, it is. To uh, figure out how to regulate it or change the, change the direction of some of it. Yeah. Here, here's a better answer. Um, what's the best way to fight it? Don't repeat it. Right? So if you're, if you're on social media, first get off. But if you're on social media, uh, honestly, I, just don't use things like Facebook for political talk, because that's just not what it's appropriate for, I don't think. Like, it's good for sharing pictures of your kids or your dog or whatever. But it's just not the right way to talk about politics and religion. I love talking about politics and religion, and I will do it to anybody face to face. And I will never do it over Facebook. This is not the right medium. So just don't do that. Don't share. Don't click. Don't retweet. Uh, Twitter is a slightly different animal. Um, but you know, don't participate. Don't feed the trolls. Another thing I think all of us should do is um, refute lies when you hear them. I have so often heard lies, and I just kind of let them pass because I, I want an even keel. I don't want to disrupt the boat. Um, but look, I think, I think we just need to say, hey, oh, you know what? That's not true. I don't, I don't think that's true. I don't think the 2020 election was stolen. Right? And if we just kind of said it more often, it might help at least the rest of us understand how isolated those beliefs really are. I think un, unchallenged lies gain steam by seeming more popular than they really are. Okay. Yeah. What are the signs and symptoms of Christian nationalism in this election for 2022? And you like some parts about it and some parts you don't? Um, 
I think there's definitely some candidates who fit in this categories that I've mentioned. Uh, I'm deeply concerned about um, election denialism, which is not definitionally attached to Christian nationalism, but it does tend to overlap in practice. Um, and I, yeah, there's a correlation, but not a causation, sure. Uh, and I, I will be watching very carefully next week to see if election denying candidates uh, win or lose. That, that to me is a key indicator about how healthy or not our democracy really is. So you definitely think election denying is a small part of this big world that we're in? Yes, I think it's probably the most dangerous part. I really do. Uh, of the things that people are willing to say publicly, that's the, in my book, the worst. It is hard for me to convey what January 6th uh, meant and means and what it felt like because I lived, I live right outside DC and my wife used to work on Capitol Hill. Um, and so the people going around still today saying the 2020 election was stolen uh, is hard for me to put into polite words um, how dangerous I think that is. Uh, I, I just don't think that is healthy for our democracy. And so those candidates are the ones that I'm most concerned about. Uh, up there. You say that American Christian nationalism is inherently white. Oh. Uh, once again, we're out of time. Um, <clears throat> is Christ, you said, is Christian nationalism white? Yeah, is the, the, the version I often get of that question is, is Christian nationalist, nationalism, is it racist? Right? Um, if you listen to the, the overt rhetoric, if you just take at face value what they say they believe, the answer is no. They're not saying overtly white nationalist or racist things, which is an improvement over 80 years ago, 50 years ago, right? However, if you also look at embodied practice, if you look at uh, the full constellation of attitudes as reflected in public opinion polling, what you find that is that those who uh, score highest on measures of Christian nationalism also tend to be the Americans. If you ask them in a poll, if you say, in, a, in an altercation between police and an unarmed African American, who's at fault? The Christian nationalists are the ones who say, it's the African American who's at fault. And, the, and, the, and it's not close. Right? If you just take these kind of the median position, most Americans are here, and the Christian nationalists are kind of over here saying, you know, they're siding with the police. The same kind of phenomenon happens on immigration, on, uh, on Muslim immigration, on um, guns, uh, on interracial marriage. Sort of issue after issue after issue, you see these patterns where there's a different set of racial attitudes that co-varies with Christian nationalist attitudes. And so that statistical uh, coincidence is definitely there, despite the overt rhetoric not being overtly racist. Uh, you mentioned it all about liberalism. Uh, what, do you think of, what do you think is bad about liberalism? Liberalism, yeah. Um, it depends on what you mean by liberalism. Yeah. And actually, I just have an essay up today on a site called Near Orthodoxy uh, talking about liberalism and progressivism, which is the word I use to mean the, the left. So when I, when I use the word liberalism, I'm talking about classical 18th century John Locke liberalism. Um, and uh, it's not perfect, but uh, it's I, honestly better than the alternatives. You know, as, as Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the other ones. Um, and that's kind of how I think about liberal, classical liberalism. Um, it is not the kingdom of God, and it is not in the Bible. And yet, when I think about the golden rule, do unto others, what is democracy except the political golden rule? I treat you as an equal, you treat me as an equal. I recognize your rights, you recognize my rights. I give you freedom, you give me freedom. It's the golden rule. And so if you want a, a political application of a foundational principle of the Bible and of natural law, it kind of works out into some version of the open society, democracy, liberalism, whatever you want to call it. It's also uh, consistent with the, you know, the emphasis on human dignity, the image of God. We respect every individual, which by the way, no other form of government has ever done. 
right? Every other form of government has picked some category of person to say, you're not good enough. Usually women, usually ethnic minorities, religious minorities, and sexual minorities. Democracy is kind of the only one that's even tried to claim we're all going to be equal. It's pretty good in my book. Are there problems? Sure, particularly the way we practice democracy in this country. It's honestly more of an oligarchy. Uh, I, I hate to say it, but it's true. So I'd love to change that. Um, I think there's great virtues in ranked choice voting I'd like to experiment with. Our first past the post single member constituency is pretty terrible. So I can nitpick features of our constitution and our laws, but the basic principle of the open society, it's pretty great. Do you see Christian nationalism as a global problem? And if yes, where would you point that out? Yeah, absolutely yes. Nationalism is wildly popular all around the world. It's been on an upsurge for almost 10 years now. And among the first places we saw it was Hungary, which is definitely a Christian nationalist country under uh, Viktor Orban. They amended their constitution a few years ago to say that uh, Hungary is a Christian nation and that all institutions must honor Christianity. Uh, to, it's, that's not the exact wording, but it's something to that effect. Um, and many American Christian nationalists have, have made pilgrimages to Hungary to like, learn from it. Rod Dreher and Patrick Deneen and others. They, they, and Orban came to the United States just a couple months ago, addressed CPAC. Uh, so Hungary is an example. Uh, Brazil until this week. Right, when they voted out Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro was, at least rhetorically, Christian nationalist, sort of Catholic nationalist, trying to emphasize Brazil's unifying Catholic culture. Russia. Uh, Russia is definitely uh, Christian nationalist. Um, you look at the Russian Orthodox Church and the way that it has uh, abased itself to the Kremlin, endorsed Russia's aggressive war in Ukraine, Look at Vladimir Putin's argument for war in Ukraine. It's a nationalist argument. He says we need to reunify with the Russian people in Ukraine and we need to reunify with Kievian Rus, the, 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 place, the birthplace of the Russian Orthodox religion. Uh, it's exactly a, a nationalist argument and it's an Orthodox Christian nationalist argument. So I think Russia is a good example as well and it's a perfect example of the dangers of Christian nationalism. This seems to be, I mean, to Tocqueville and everybody else has sort of made these same sort of arguments about the way this nation started off. Because, first of all, both of our leaders were deists, um, not exactly Christians in the sense that we, that at least the conservative Christians wish to battle today. But the other part of the argument I think that at least I haven't heard so far is the economics of it. The, the Christian right has made sure that there are some parts of the economy that have been moved from previous concentrations into less concentrated areas. Uh, and I'll pick the, the nuclear material that's being moved from Oak Ridge down to Lynchburg, uh, things like this. I'm sorry. That's all right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, there's definitely uh, economic nationalism. Um, I'm not sure it maps clearly onto Christian nationalism. Look, nationalism is a broad and popular thing. And there is a religious component that I've emphasized today. There is an economic component of people who want to restrict free trade, uh, bolster trade unions, uh, repatriate industries uh, back home, and, and that sort of thing. Um, I don't have a blanket uh, thumbs up, thumbs down on economic nationalism. I'm actually pretty okay with the idea of decoupling our economy from China's. I think that's a pretty good thing. Um, and if the economic nationalism makes it easier to raise a family, I'm all for that too. I'm skeptical about the government's power to do this. As, look, I worked for the government for 10 years. <laughs> they don't know their stuff very well. Uh, so we'll see. If any of the uh, ideas can bear fruit, uh, you know, more power to them. But, but count me a bit skeptical. Or what have we gotten wrong in Afghanistan? Or why, why are you writing a book on Afghanistan? I spent 10 years working on the war in Afghanistan. I served there with the Army. I was uh, on the CIA desk, in the Afghanistan desk of the CIA, and then the Afghanistan desk in the White House for two presidents. That's why I'm writing a book on it. Um, 
so 10 years of my life, and uh, it all came crashing down a year ago. The book is entitled, the working title is Choosing Defeat, How America Lost Afghanistan. And for this book, I have interviewed 65 to 70 policymakers from the past three presidential administrations on the record, including Condoleezza Rice and David Petraeus and Bob Gates. And uh, I think I'm up to five national security advisors and six secretaries of defense and everybody. I mean, I've interviewed them all to get their first person story of what they were thinking while they were in office overseeing America's longest war. And now I'm synthesizing this into a 20 year narrative of what we were thinking. Um, that's what the book is. And uh, it's, uh, it's a little emotionally draining to write this thing, but it, I, I just, I have to get it off my chest. Uh, can I preview any of it in you know, 30 seconds or less? Uh, here's a few things that have stuck out to me so far. Um, or maybe just the one thing. We took the war against Al Qaeda very seriously. And we were extremely good at killing terrorists. And for 20 years, we killed a lot of people that we've said were terrorists. And our machinery, our technology, and our bureaucracy for killing terrorists was astonishing. Astonishing. The war against the Taliban, separate group, never came close to that. No one took it that seriously. Uh, not no one. A few people did. General McChrystal did. Uh, but the policymakers were laser focused on Al Qaeda. But when it came to the Taliban, which is the group we lost the war to last year, there was never that sense of urgency, that sense of importance, that sense that this is the thing, right? We're going to win or lose based on this. No one ever thought that. Laser focused on a, getting a big pile of dead terrorists. And, and not the same kind of urgent focus on rebuilding Afghanistan, fighting a counterinsurgency, uh, either defeating the Taliban or bringing them to the table. None of that was ever treated with the same level of seriousness. Now, my last book was on just war theory. And just war says, you fight a war for the sake of a better peace. When I look at a war in Afghanistan, I see a pile of dead terrorists and no peace. 